Um, so hello everyone who joined very recently and welcome to the Cardiff University Royal Institute of Philosophy annual lecture for 2022. I'm very pleased to be introducing our speaker tonight, Professor T Nguyen, who is Associate Professor at the University of Utah. Uh, Professor Nguyen works across many areas of philosophy, but um, focused on the central question of how our thoughts and actions are affected by the worlds that we're embedded in. Uh, so this includes research on how technology and different kinds of social structures shape the way that we communicate, how we gain knowledge, how and what we trust and what we value. Professor Nguyen's first book, Games, Agency is Art, uh, was published in 2022 and won a very prestigious book prize from the American Philosophical Association. Uh, one of the key claims explored in the book is that games are artworks of agency, that they generate a library of agencies for us to try out. And they do this by providing different goals, storing systems, win and lose situations that structure our actions within a game. And the experiences that we have in acting on the different kinds of motivations that you get in different games, different ways of measuring our success, show us how fluid our agency really is. This can be used very positively to develop ourselves as autonomous agents. Uh, there are, though, potentially harmful effects of gamifying different aspects of our lives, and one of these is the subject of the talk today on value collapse. Uh, so just before uh, we start the talk, um, if you have a question at any point during the talk or during the Q&A, please type that into the chat function in YouTube. Um, and we will make sure that we pick up on those questions in the Q&A session at the end. Um, so with that, um, please give a warm welcome to Professor Nguyen. Hello, it's great to be here in this strange online environment. I actually, in the current, uh, in the current settings, I have no idea how many people in the audience. So it could be one or it could be a hundred. Or it could be, I, I've got no clue. So to all of you, hello. Um, all right, so uh, the talk I'm giving today is called Value Collapse. And um, the, this started, the genesis of this was, in, actually I have my book right here, I can show you my book. Here's the book. So this started with uh, me trying to figure out what was special about games and kind of struggling against a lot of pictures that said what made games magical was that they were kind of fiction or they told stories. And I wanted to say that it was something about action. And the thing that really unlocked it for me was this moment when my favorite game designer, I'm, I'm geeky enough to have a favorite game designer, it's Reiner Knizia, the German Mozart of European board game design. Anyway, he's at this uh, game developer conference and he says, the most important thing in my game design toolbox is the point system because the point system tells the players what to care about during the game. It sets their desires. And, you know, for an old time board gamer like me, I'm like, yeah, of course, that makes sense. But then, like, I put on my philosophy hat and I immediately think, holy shit, that's right. Games tell you what to want. And so in this games book, I spent a lot of time talking about how wonderful this is, how game designers can use this to shape alternate selves for us. But what I've really started to worry about is that that is wonderful in the very limited context of a game. And what's special about a game is that it's this temporary secluded environment and you step back from those desires. And then in other contexts, when you gamify the rest of our lives, in particular, when you offer us clear metrics and points and scores, for our actual lives, in Twitter, in education, in research, something else happens. And that brings me to today's talk. So, value collapse. So, can you all see my slides, by the way? Um, okay, awesome. So, one of the things I can't, let's start with a loose observation. There are times when you're trying to do something and when you try to make your values very explicit, that is, in particular, to give them some, to connect them to some kind of metric that makes them incredibly clear, incredibly easy to apply, easy to aggregate, easier to measure on a watch. Something weird goes wrong. Uh, something weird happens. So, one of the places you can see this around the world is how clearly institutions of the world are starting to target these really narrow targets that seem to miss a lot of what's really important. Like Netflix seems to be making television aimed at targeting streaming hours, not being moved by art or the wonder of, 
of a story, but simply streaming hours. Newspapers have started to target page views above everything else, above newsworthiness, both informational content. And for a lot of us like me, you can, you, you, we find ourselves in social media drawn to target likes and follows. And notice that those are really thin measures. Those are measures of popularity. Now, I just want to note, this is just starting thought, that there are lots of things you can care about in communication with other people via social media, like empathy, understanding, connection, that aren't measured by a popularity measure like the like. So, but I, I think when, when you start to think about this, it's really easy to get drawn into these really newfangled technological versions. But I think these are really old, right? There are lots of versions of this that aren't just Twitter. So I think it's really easy in fitness to get really sucked into just concentrating on weight loss, BMI, calories burned, steps. It's really easy in education when you're a student to get obsessed with your GPA or the rank of the college that admitted you on some ranked list by some magazine. Uh, I got really interested in this when the by reading stuff about the winemaking world and how the coming of quantified scoring just seemed to have seized the attention of everyone in the winemaking world and kind of dragged wine in the direction of the kinds of things that score well on those kinds of measures, which by the way, tend to be really loud, big fruity wines and not kind of delicate wines. You can also see this kind of like for whole life measures. I mean, money is a really obvious example or the prestige of your employment or the rank at your job. But I think some of the clearest examples for us are examples of the institutional level, where you can see the institution that you're in suddenly become all of its attention gets directed to some very particular measures that we all know don't capture everything that's important. Like medicine starts moving towards lives saved only or patient satisfaction scores or schools get obsessed with enrollment rates. Um, a previous school as, as I was uh, employed at as I was leaving was interested more and more in optimizing student success, which was measured in only two quantities, which was graduation rate and graduation speed, and that's it. No wisdom, no reflection, no depth, just graduation rate and graduation speed. With policing, there's case closure rates. Uh, with restaurants, there's Yelp scores. I, I was on a podcast called um, A Philosopher and a Pastor Walk Into a Bar, and as we were talking about this, the pastor half of the hosting team said, oh yeah, this is my life now. My church higher ups, all they care about is baptism numbers. They're just constantly telling us to up our baptism numbers. And there's an internal leaderboard where all the parishes are in like frenzied competition to see who can up their baptism numbers. And at some point you think like that, <laughs> when religious spirituality <laughs> has become centered on upping your baptism rates, something has gone wrong. So. And I just want to say, to be really clear, I'm not talking about the temporary use of a target to get at some deeper value. I think a lot of people find very motivating for the moment trying to up their marathon miles. I'm a climber, right? I spend a lot of time trying to climb a stronger, uh, uh, a more highly rated problem. Uh, sorry, a problem that has a higher difficulty rating. I'm talking, of, I'm really concerned with those moments where your core values, your controlling values become extremely explicit. And the difference is something like, if you've just adopted a temporary val uh, a value, like I'm just going to try to up my marathon mileage, you can sometimes step back and look at that from a larger perspective. You can ask, is this making me happier? Is this making me healthier? Is this making my life go better? But if this has happened to your core values, my worry is there's, there's no kind of break on the narrowing effect of this kind of quantification. Okay, so there's this just general thought that there's something weird and screwed up. So I'm gonna, I, I've been trying to offer explanations for this and I'll tell you about a few of the others, but this paper, I'm gonna try to offer you one partial explanation about why this goes wrong, which is something like this. Here's the core argument that I'm, you're, you're gonna see this slide a lot of times, but the core argument is that our values drive our attention. And when you make highly explicit values, they place clear boundaries on the intention. They tell you what's inside the, the, this clear boundary is worth paying attention to and what's outside is absolutely not. And this narrows your attention. And that kind of focus, precise narrowing of the attention functionally encourages closed mindedness about value. It puts you in a kind of relationship to the world where you're not actively looking for or open to new signs of value in the world that you've missed. It locks you in to whatever conception of value you had. 
So uh, this discussion of value collapse comes from a larger project that, that I think it'll help to talk about a little. So this is something I started talking about at the end of my games book, and this has been my obsession for the last few years. So let me step back a bit and talk about it. So I'm th interested in a phenomenon that I'm calling value capture. So value capture is when an agent, and here I mean like a person, but also maybe a group, like an institution, a department, a university, a company, an agent's values might be rich and subtle or developing in that direction. And that agent enters a social environment that presents simplified, typically but not always quantified versions of those values. And those simplified values come to dominate the agent in their thinking. So for example, going to school for an education and getting obsessed with GPA or starting on social media for connection and getting obsessed with likes and followers and retweets or exercising for health and then getting obsessed with BMI or step counts. Uh, I started noticing this in my life because I'm, I'm not sure uh, how many people in the audience know about this, but in my profession, there's a single list that ranks the status of every journal you could publish in and another list that ranks the status of every university you could be employed at. And a lot of us, I've seen this happen. This happened, this started happening to me. You go into philosophy because you love wisdom and depth and these cool ideas. And after grad school, you come out and I can see the other philosophers I can see right now nodding, just obsessed with what your highest placement in a journal on this list is. And you would have thought that if anyone was resistant to this, it would be the philosophers who are supposed to be about wisdom. But nope, we're as much cultural as the rest. I mean, you might have thought that churches would be resistant, but then we have baptism numbers. Okay, so I also think this can happen to groups. So a department can be captured by the importance of student satisfaction scores. Police departments can be captured by case closure rates. Universities can be captured by the US News and World Report's school rankings, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So I just wanna point out, by the way, a reason I wanna make this clear is it can, when I talk about the stuff, it can start to look like what I'm talking about is like the individual versus society, right? Here's the lone individual with their true values and their society that's going to screw up with them. That's not what I'm talking about because I'm also worried about social groupings that whose values can be captured by larger scale social groupings. And I think one of the things that I'm going to try to get at today is a lot of what's going on is not the individual versus society. It's about conflicts of scale. It's about conflicts between individuals or smaller communities with large, impersonal, global, national institutions. So there's an excellent, by the way, people interested in this stuff, there's this wonderful uh, literature um, across fields like anthropology and sociology and communications um, that spins out of a field called science and technology studies. And it's various people studying the relationship between quantification and bureaucracy. And this is one of my favorite books in this space. This is Wendy Esplin and Michael Souder's Engines of Anxiety, uh, which is a study of what happened to law school culture in America and legal culture in general when the US News and World Report started issuing clear rankings of the law school. Uh, by the way, when I first read this, uh, I was on a plane and I was like gasping in horror and shuddering. And the person next to me was like, are you reading a horror novel? And I was like, really close. I'm reading the history of higher education and metrics. And they thought I was really weird. Anyway, so what the US News, what this book says is that before uh, the US News and World Report, there was no central ranking right? So schools would declare different missions and you had to kind of ask people um, and about what the schools were like. And there was this book called Barron's that gave qualitative descriptions of the schools and described their missions. And from a certain light, it's really clear why the US News and World Report rankings are really valuable. That kind of information before the New, the US News and World Report rankings was kind of unclearly disseminated. If you were kind of outside of the culture, you didn't have as much access. So the US News and World Report kind of centralizes information and makes it highly accessible, but then it does something else because there's a single ranking. It kind of captures all the information in the space. And one of the things that they say is that the US News and World Report drives value plurality out of the system. 
So before that report, before that ranking, different law schools used to pursue lots of very different missions. So some pursued kind of like corporate job missions, getting their students high paying jobs. Other pursued more theoretical researchy missions. Uh, some pursued outreach to local minorities or underserved populations. Some were really interested in helping their students get social justice educations and work for social justice. And it turns out that almost none of the things I mentioned are measured by the US News and World Report. The US News and World Report consists of a status survey and then mostly a number of factors that are incoming class GPA, uh, acceptance and rejection rate, and outgoing classes employment rate in the nine month mark. And one of the things that seems to happen is when you spend resources on something that isn't measured by the rankings, like for example, serving underserved minority communities in your area, then you plunge in the rankings because you're spending on resources on something that isn't measured. So one of the things they say is that everyone kind of gets forced to pursue whatever it is that this measures. Um, I talked about that. So um, there's one more thing I just want to mention. This isn't the center of today's talk, but I just find it so interesting. It's what got me excited in this whole space, or not excited, depressed. It's what made me horribly depressed in this whole space. So one of the things they say is that students used to kind of be triggered by this moment of value plurality into figuring out what they actually cared about. If each school represented their values and their mission in a substantially different way that wasn't reducible to a single rank, then students would have to ask, do I care about money? Do I care about research? Do I care? And it would seem to trigger these conversations. Um, and one of the things they say, and this is, this is based on a careful empirical study, a lot of which is possible because a lot of the stuff is archived on internet forums with pre-law students talking to each other. One of the things Esplan and Souders say is the moment the U.S. News and World Report starts issuing its rankings, students stop deliberating about their values in a law school education. Uh, what they seem to do is take their goal just to be get to get into the best school, and the U.S. News and World Report just to set what best is. So, to translate what I just said into my own terms into philosopher's terms. I think what's going on in value capture cases is that value capture disrupts the process of self-determination. That we should in some sense be choosing our values for ourselves and tailoring them to ourselves, but value capture cuts out of that process and substitutes a prefabricated and standardized value for a personally or locally tailored one. So why is value capture bad? I've, I've been we're still in the big picture background here. There are a few possibilities. One is that you sh it just damages your autonomy, that you should be picking your values for yourself, Raleigh, and here you just don't. Another, and this is something I've been really working on elsewhere, is that it involves outsourcing your values. And like any other outsourcing, those values are less tailored to you, but easier to pick up, right? They're, they're made at scale. The last possibility is that value capture typically involves highly explicit values and that those are somehow bad in and of themselves, no matter their source. So today I want to explore this option, that there's something really weird about making your values highly explicit. And I mean explicit here, not just that we can put them into words, but they're explicit in the way that bureaucratic measures are explicit. That is, they have criteria for application that are very clear and mechanically applicable, right? So let me get some coffee. So um, back to value collapse. So that was the background in value capture. So I'm going to try today to give you an epistemic argument about why explicit values might be bad. That is, I'm going to try to give you an argument in terms of how value collapse interferes with our ability to truly know about the world and in particular, truly investigate what's value about the world, valuable about the world. So I'm going to say that explicit values turn out to be this kind of sticky attentional trap. That once you get them, they grab your attention and stick it to one place. And it's very hard to turn your gaze, not impossible, but hard. So um, what happens in the US News and World Report case is it's not just that administrators see this as a pos the ranking as a possibly important thing that they can trade off against with other values. What seems to happen in the Esplanade Souter uh, description is that after a while, 
those advancing on the racking, rankings becomes the core value of administrators. And once it becomes a core value, something funky seems to happen. And I want to describe it this way, that it looks like the clarity of those value statements grabs their collective attention and kind of drives out attention to any kind of subtler forms of value education. So you often see in the empirical literature, the sociological level, people noting that this happens, but there's weirdly a uh, little psychological literature on it, which, it, which I find interesting. Uh, another example besides the college rankings examples is from Theodore Porter, who we're going to talk about more today. He's a wonderful historian of uh, quantification culture. And his book, Trust in Numbers, contains, and here are words I never thought I would say, a truly thrilling set of chapters on the history of the cost-benefit analysis. It is amazing. And part of what you learn in this is that, so the cost-benefit analysis came out of the French and American Army Corps of Engineers. And one of the things Porter says is, oh, you might have thought, a lot of people thought the reason that we got cost-benefit analyses was because it's engineers and engineers love numbers. Turns out that's not true at all. And what actually happened was that the Army Corps of Engineers used to decide on projects using a rich qualitative a process that paid attention to many possible values or hard to quantify. And then they got accused by Congress of nepotism and pork barreling. And so they had to come up with some kind of clear, objective looking justificational process. And they came up with a cost benefit analysis, which is you put a price tag on a project and you look at the plausible financial benefits uh, and then you just add them up and see where it goes. So notice uh, once this gets going, says Porter, the cost benefit analysis just becomes very quickly dominant across political and business culture as a mode of justification. But again, notice what it leaves out. There are all kinds of benefits that the Army Corps of Engineers used to take into consideration that are very hard to put into a cost benefit analysis, like the beauty of your city, right? Or the improvement to some sense of well being besides that which just gets you back to work. So, um, and so what I want to point out, and this will maybe help understand, get clear on what I mean by explicit, is that I'm not saying that the value is unstatable, because I'm, I'm stating these values, right? Beauty, well-being, supporting underserved groups. But it is often very hard to translate a value like that into quick and clear measurements of incoming candidates. What seems to happen in a lot of these cases is you get a new criteria that allows for a mechanical or nearly mechanical evaluation via some simple, repeatable procedure or formula. So you might think, okay, this is no big deal. These are just bad metrics, right? Let's just get some better metrics. The problem is the cost benefit analysis doesn't get everything. So we need something better. What I'm going to try to give you an account is that there's some is an account of why there's something essentially problematic about clear explication itself for values. So, so what's wrong with ex explicit values? So by the way, in some sense, everything I've done so far is background and now here we are. Here's, here's the actual argument that I want to say. Sorry, this took forever. But what's wrong with explicit values? So clearly it might be missing something, but all of our attempts to describe the world or state or evaluate it might be missing something. We are fallible, finite beings. The worry is that explicit values make it hard to notice what's missing. That is, they make it hard to improve. So why don't we notice what's missing? I think there's a simple anecdote. I've felt and seen versions of this in myself and my friends all the time. And here's a common version of it. It's something like, oh, I was so obsessed with weight loss that I didn't notice that my joints were hurting and I was tired and depressed and energyless. I was losing weight. And that number just seemed to make me not notice all the other stuff, right? I've had people in philosophy tell me that they didn't notice for a decade that they were bored with their work, but they were getting publications in high status mag art journals. The philosophers I can see in my feet are all laughing and nodding just so everyone can see. Um, so here's the first pass that there's something about explicitness that makes it hard to notice some relevant new forms of information. Here I'm really inspired by this extraordinary philosopher that I think is too little read, uh, William Wimsatt, who's a philosopher of science. Um, and he's this book that has maybe the coolest, dorkiest, coolest, coolest title in philo modern philosophy, which is Reengineering Philosophy for Limited Beings, Piecewise Approximations of Reality. 
And what he was really suggesting was that there was something, he was actually saying there's something wrong with traditional philosophical method. And his way of putting it was this, he thought science is better in a certain way. We are limited beings with limited resources and we're fallible. We can't get things perfectly right and you can't really get principles for action by deducing from the top down from some pure conception of the good. What you need to do are make what you need to do are to make best guesses to get kind of heuristic principles up and running and then learn from your mistakes. What this means is whatever your way is of navigating the world, you need some method to notice, intake and use mistakes and use them to improve your heuristics. So again, the way for cognitive beings to proceed is not to deduce perfection from on high, but to make guesses, operate under those guesses, make mistakes, and then incorporate those mistakes. Here's an extraordinary phrase for this that I love, error metabolism, right? Limited beings need heuristics plus a process of error metabolism, of ingesting errors and turning them into something better. So here is, um, here is my proposal. Explicit values would be a problem if one, our attempts at explicating values often left out important aspects of what was valuable. And two, the explicitness itself prevented error metabolism. That was something about the explicitness made us harder for us to see and eat and digest and improve from our errors. I'm going to talk a little bit about the first part and then spend most of the next uh, uh, the rest of this talk on the second part because that's that is the main idea here. But for the background, I think it'll be useful to see why explicit values as we find them in the world often leave a lot of stuff out. So I'm going to suggest that a lot of the explicit values we see are there because of the, they're the result of institutional processes and institutional processes systematically exclude certain kinds of information. So here again, I'm, so I'm, I, I'm not saying anything in here. I'm just get, basically going to give you a book report of people that are way cooler than me that I've been obsessively reading. So um, Theater Reporter, Trust in Numbers, kind of um, the Engines of Anxiety book I talked before. I, Wendy Esplin I take to be kind of the current heir to the thing that started with Theater Reporter. Uh, and for the philosophers in the room, Theater Reporter obsessively read Philosophers of Science. There's a lot of hacking and Latour in the background here. So, um, so Porter is really interested in the trade-off between quantification and qualitative, sorry, quantitative forms of knowing and qualitative forms of knowing. He's not saying that either is better, but he thinks that each of them has strengths and weaknesses, and he's worried about a world in which people become entirely reliant on quantified methods of knowing. So what he says is that qualitative methods of knowing are rich nuanced and context sensitive, but they travel badly between different contexts and they don't aggregate. Quantitative ways of knowing, and I just want to be clear, he doesn't mean quantification in principle, he means as we find it in real world institutions pressed into the services, into the kind of service we need in, in real world institutions. Quantification uh, focuses on some invariant kernel that has the various context sensitive nuances stripped off of it. This means that it can travel easily between layers, between people with different contexts, and uh, that it can aggregate easily. For me, the easiest example for this is letter grades in schooling, right? We can offer our students incredibly complex, rich, multidimensional qualitative evaluations of their work, like you know my responses to my students' essays, but I don't think the business school dean is going to understand uh, what a philosophy person writes in, in their philosophy student evaluations. And, most, and even more importantly, that stuff doesn't aggregate. Shift to the grade point average, right? If we give everyone in the United States, it's a letter grade that corresponds to, one, to a numeral from one to four. It strips off all this nuance. It strips off all this complexity. All it gives you is a relative ranking. But that travels instantly, it's comprehensible, and it's instantly aggregatable, right? Um, so in, Bowker, uh, in Jeff Bowker and Susan Lee Starr's extraordinary book, Sorting Things Out, which is a history of classification and standardization, they put it this way. This is a very similar point. 
large scale data collection efforts need standardized categories. So if each of us came up with our different category system, we couldn't aggregate the data. So that requires that we regularize the input rules and the processing rules and regularize the classifications. So they say that every classification system you can think of as kind of a set of information buckets and those buckets emphasize the information at the boundaries and forget the information inside. So a simple example, the US census, right? It records ethnicity data. It records there's a Latino category, an Asian category, right? So those categories emphasize the difference between Latino and Asian. They capture that data, but they forget the data that's like the kind of Latino or the kind of Asian, right? So background star don't say this is bad. What they say is that this is required in any kind of database collection aggregation system to manage the overload of information. But what they say is that every data collection effort has to omit certain information which represents a choice, which represents certain interests. It serves a purpose. And that's fine as long as we know what purpose that served and we know what we're forgetting. But they're worried about those cases where we forget those were choices and we kind of just let it enter the background of our world and we just assume, oh yeah, that's the world. It's Asians and Latinos and Blacks, right? That's just how the way the world is. Um, so there's a quick, quick tour through another literature to give you a sense about why you might think that explicit values, as we find them in institutions, often leave out important aspects of value. There might be other reasons, but I think this one explains a lot of the, the versions of explicit values that I run into the world. And it also shows us that this problem will be heightened in the institutional context. All right, more coffee. Here we are, finally, the heart, the central idea. So now we need to figure out why, if the values leave out important things, why they can't learn from their mistakes. We need to figure out why explicitness might prevent error metabolism. So I'm gonna try to claim that highly explicit values drive our attention in a way that make it really unlikely that we'll be able to improve them in the light of relevant information. What I'm gonna say basically is that explicit, explicating our values makes us look at the world in a way that we are unlikely to find new value information. All right, so back to the core ideas. So um, here's the core thought. Uh, values drive attention. Explicit values place clear boundaries on the attention. And the core idea is that in the grip of explicit values, we're not gonna be motivated to pay attention to things that might l tell us about gaps in the explication of our value. Um, so I think the simplest example here, uh, the example that I keep returning to, uh, and is I think, I think something a lot of us recognize, which is something like, suppose I value only money. If I value only money, then I'm only going to pay attention to the things that are likely to give me money. And I'm not going to pay attention to, you know, art or philosophy or literature, which are likely sources that could reveal that there are other things meaningful in life besides money. So a way to put it is that because money is such a clear target, it's easier and quicker for me to dismiss things because they're not making me money. Um, and there's, here's a super, hopefully that maybe this is helpful. Here's a simple example from my own life. So I've been trying to write this paper, trying to explain what, why Twitter was screwing with my soul. And I was only look at things, looking at things that obviously bore on Twitter and not getting anywhere. At some point, I kind of gave up and started playing around and reading other kinds of weird stuff just for fun. And I ended up reading Ted Cohen's Jokes Again, which is this incredible account of the intimacy of small scale jokes, and in, in particular, the intimacy of saying things where you leave out some of the background and other people fill in the background. And that turned out to be incredibly useful for me to explain Twitter. And that unlocked this entire thing I was trying to write. But it happened when I went off exploring and let myself soak in something that had no obvious bearing to what I was working on, right? And the reason is because its bearing wasn't evident on its face, right? See if that, does that make sense? Like what did it, if you just get incredibly focused on a project and you only look at the things that obviously bear on that project, whose value bears on the project you're working on, then you're gonna miss anything whose relevance is a little more complicated and a little more subtle. So my key claim here isn't that it's impossible to expand one's values if they're explicit, but it's unlikely 
because attention, because values condition your intention, uh, condition your attention in a way that you won't be motivated to seek out the kinds of things that might expand your sense of value. And I, I just want to say here, I'm not saying that there's a clear binary between like, here's real values and here's collapsed values. This thing I'm describing is kind of variable and I'm trying to figure out the conditions and phenomena that might heighten and lessen this quality of collapse. So someone might respond to me at this point. Not all attention is driven by values. So there are two kinds of attention uh, as people uh, in the psychology literature. There's active attention, the attention that's under your voluntary control and is driven by your values and choices. And there's passive attention. There's the world jumps out at you and notices you. So someone who is listening to this whole thing might say to me, look, I'm not so worried after all. If let's, let's agree for a moment that what it is to a, place attention is to expend some epistemic effort. You, T, all you're saying is that values drive active attention. And so they're going to narrow active attention. But we have an escape hatch, passive attention. Passive attention is untouched and uncontrolled by values. And so narrow values aren't a problem because passive attention is the route by which we discover new values. So my response to that objection is there's something in that, but the escape hatch is there but it's much narrower than you think. And the reason is because what's valuable is often subtle. So let me distinguish between, and I think this has been coming up for me a lot in different things I've been working on. Some values are obvious. The value is graspable, graspable immediately, but a lot of other values are subtle. It takes time and effort to see the value. The value of philosophy, the value of critical thinking, the value of literature, the value of difficult art like jazz or my beloved Marian, like the poems of Marian Moore, the value of yoga. Each of these things takes effort, right? They're not graspable instantly. So obvious values can be grasped through passive attention, but for subtle values, you need continuous effort. So passive attention would have to be followed up with some kind of active attention to continue the effort long enough to grasp a subtle value. But with subtle values, the value of the object isn't clear at first. So even if passive attention leaps it to your four, right, you won't see the value in that moment. And you'll likely dismiss something that you've only briefly noticed. Uh, I'm imagining something here. The simple model is going to be something like the person that only cares about money is going to go into the world and a mural will pop out to them and they'll be like, well, is it profitable? No, nope. and move on, right? Sorry, that might be too simple, but it'll help you get onto the thing. I'm worried about. Um, so why think values are subtle? I think there's just tons of examples, right? I spent a lot of my life thinking that, I mean, I, I think obsessively about my, my misunderstanding of exercise. I used to think it was this horrible thing that you did to lose weight. <laughs> and it took years with it after having refused to do it for 25 years of my life. It took years for me to see all the kind of spiritual and aesthetic wonders in exercise. Tal Brewer in his wonderful book, The Retrieval of Ethics, has a really rich story about this, about how the value of activity takes a long time to grasp. And he says that we go through this dialectical process, we have a sense of an activity and we have a rough, often very flawed sense of its value. And that shapes how we do the activity. And as we spend time in the activity, we start to see, no, no, here's the glimmering of some other value. And we reformulate the value, which changes how we do the activity. And then we see more deeply. And this can take years a lifetime. So, okay, let's, let's step back a bit. I'll have some more coffee. So what seems to be doing the work in this kind of value collapse is that when you make the boundaries of a value explicit in a certain way, that is when you make their application clear and quick and unambiguous, then it becomes really easy to dismiss things that fall outside. So here's another way to put the value caps collapse phenomenon. Clear and explicit values lead to a kind of inattention feedback loop. Insofar as the boundaries of what's valuable is clear, that it's easier to dismiss what's outside of it. So the explicit conception kind of rigidifies what we pay attention to. And when on the other hand, your values have boundaries that are unclear and fuzzy, then you have to spend time and energy thinking about potential candidates. You don't know that they're unimportant. So you have to grapple with them. When you have clear boundaries that can be quickly applied, then you can quickly dismiss potential candidates. That's kind of the core of the story, I think. Um, so having a rigid boundary would, since this is an epistemic argument, there would be no problem with a rigid boundary if you were guaranteed that your explications of value were fully correct. 
God could have explicit values, maybe, right? But for us, beings that are finite and are likely to get it wrong, they're stuck in institutions that will present systematically impoverished information sets, then we need error metabolism. And the worry here is that the value attention loop cuts off error metabolism. Here's another way to put it. Wayne Riggs, um, the, a philosopher who did a lot of wonderful work on open-mindedness and closed-mindedness, says that what it is to be, he, he says that it, there's an incorrect view that a lot of people have, which is to be op closed-minded is to be too confident. He's like, plenty of open-minded people are confident too. What he thinks is going on is that to be closed-minded is to operate as if you are certainly right. And to be open-minded is not to lack confidence, but to operate under the understanding that you're fallible and to operate with procedures that open you up to evidence of fallibility, that are constantly looking for evidence that you've uh, made mistakes. So one way to put it is that making your values explicit encodes in their formulation the spirit of closed-mindedness, right? It, is, it acts in a way as if they're certainly right. What would encode open-mindedness is a fuzzier, something more unquaint where we'd more equately put values where we had to really wrestle with the boundary cases. One more thought, institutions make this worse. So remember, um, I've already said that we should expect values uh, that are kind of denuded a lot of a lot of context sensitive and nuance to emergent in institutions. Um, and there's a lot of pressure in institutions to adopt similar values. So this is important because I think there's another escape hatch that's lurking. So another escape hatch from value collapse is if you're around other people that you trusted who insisted on the value of other things and gave you reason to spend time on them. This is how I, I mean, I was very dismissive about jazz. And basically, I learned about jazz because a friend of mine whose literary taste I trusted was like, no, T, you're an idiot. Sit on this couch. We're going to do every Wednesday. You're going to sit for two hours. We're going to listen to fucking Miles Davis until you see the light. And I trusted him. And we did it for like two months and I got it. But that requires people around you with a differential value. So insofar as institutions provide, create a pressure to standardize on values and converge on the same values, then you'll be less likely to confront peers. So I, I do think trust in others is a major escape hatch. And the counterforce will be anything that makes you unlikely to encounter people with very different values that you trust. A similar nearby effect in institutions is something, I don't have a great name for this, but I want to call it engineered hermeneutical injustice. So very famously, so uh, Miranda Fricker, um, who's done wonderful work on testimonial injustice, has a concept of hermeneutical injustice, which is gaps in the conceptual vocabulary that mirror power dynamics. So the idea is basically some people, in the European context, rich white men have been able to express themselves and tailor a language that f has plenty of concepts and metaphor images to fit their position. And other people, m people with less power, have been unable to get as much control of the language. Uh, one way I sometimes think about this when I'm reading Fricker is the easiest problems in the world to explain are if f for rich white male New Yorkers with romantic troubles because there's so much literature that's charted every inch of that existence. So Fricker's really interested in those cases where there was some concept that was never in your vocabulary. So she spent a lot of time talking about what it was like before sexual harassment was a term. And a lot of women say they had this experience, but they couldn't communicate it. They couldn't think for themselves. And they often said they felt crazy. And when we invented the term, which came in feminist consciousness raising groups, women were more able to articulate to themselves and experience into each other. And that repaired a sense of just being isolated and nuts. She's interested in those cases where we never had those terms. I think what we can find in a lot of the cases I'm talking about is a kind of engineered emergent hermeneutical gap. That is institutions by creating, can create a pressure differential and can create a standardized value, which is so easy to use that terms we already had become relatively harder to use and fall into this kind of constructed new hermeneutical gap. So for example, for example, out of an example out of nowhere, if a university starts to get obsessed with student satisfaction, which is clear and measurable, other terms we already had, like wisdom and intellectual humility, start, start to look a little wonky because they're less easy to use in the institutional context. So the claim here is that hermeneutical gaps not only just form around pure voids, but around relative competition over comprehensibility. And if you engineer a form, a language that has standardized expressions that are more usable, then you're gonna create 
nearby hermeneutical gaps for anything that we don't use in such a standardized way. Um, uh, hopefully it's clear that at this point I'm just doing autobiography and trying to give myself therapy of life in university administration. Okay, big finale. What are the possible solutions? So, insofar as explicit values place firm boundaries on the attention, then they embody an attitude of closed-mindedness. Okay, so what kinds of values would embody open-mindedness? Here are some thoughts. So first of all, a lot of expressions of values occur as metaphors or in the terms of models or ideals. So you might want to be like a hero, like Charles Mill or Marion Moore. And notice there's no boundary around that concept. It's not clear at the moment you're not like Charles Mill anymore, right? Um, and Nick Riggle notes that a lot of the times when we express our personal ideas, we often do it in the form of a character archetype, like a laughing saint, right? And notice these things have a structure. There's a clear center, but not a clear boundary. It's a resemblance relationship rather than a well-bounded concept. A lot of times you have these metaphors too, like I'll live every day as if it was my last, or I want my life to be a beautiful story. Elizabeth Camp, the philosopher of language, says that metaphors are a way of gesturing at the world when we're not sure exactly what we want to point out at, when we're saying this is kind of like that, and they wear their unclarity on their face. I think it's really important that the application of metaphors and uh, sayings is not clear. So in his new book, This Beauty, Nick Riggle points out this moment that I, I, it had never occurred to me before and I love. He says, YOLO, you only live once, is actually really unclear in its application. Because you could definitely shout YOLO while you bungee jump off of a bridge. But you can also think, you only live once, so I'm not going to leave my house because it's scary out there. Right? There's a complex task of interpretation. There's not a quick and easy application. We have a useful nearby model, which is aesthetics. So the aesthetic attitude, as Jerome Stolnitz puts it, it, firmly in the Kantian tradition, is that it's supposed to be a practically unfiltered way of looking at the world. What Stolnitz said was, when we look around the world normally, we're guided by a practical attitude. That is, we have a goal, and we only see those things that are relevant to that goal. What it is to have the aesthetic attitude is to take that filter off and see the world in an unfiltered way. Right? So... Here's a big picture. Clearly explicated values permit easy dismissal of values. Fuzzily explicated values leave a lot of candidates at the boundary an open question, which makes dismissal harder. And since values drive attention, and attention is the center of your epistemic effort, an open-minded attitude about value is best served by fuzzy values. Fuzzy, inchoate, unclearly bonded, bounded values embody an attitude of the world as a place where the value is not yet fully clear. The world is a place whose value we are still in the process of coming to grasp. One last thought. That should have been the finale, but I can't, can't pass up one last thought. One more sketch hatch that I've been bothered about. So let's turn to the passive attention. So far, everything I've said has depended on passive attention being momentary, and you need active attention to have sustained attention. But you might reject that claim of mine, right? You might think maybe you get repeated instances where you keep confronting the same thing over and over again, or maybe passive attention can be sustained. Something can capture you and enthrall you. And I think these are, again, real escape hatches. I just think they're smaller than you might think. So the case of being enthralled by a chance encounter that you notice is a paradigmatic description of what it is to have a life-changing aesthetic encounter. Iris Murdoch famously talks about this moment of just being stuck in some work and looking out and seeing a beautiful kestrel. And what she says is, that moment of beauty is a moment of unselfing, where you suddenly see the value of things outside of yourself. And I think that is a real escape hatch, but it's thinner in a few ways. One, her description makes it sound as if it's immediate, but I think the capacity to look up and be struck by the beauty of a natural thing is actually a developed perceptual capacity that depends on having invested a lot of effort into seeing that kind of thing, which again, puts you in a value collapse trap. If you didn't have that sense of value, you wouldn't have developed that. All right. And I also think, but suppose that there's some enthralling encounters that don't require any trained perception, that just hit you. So here's the worry. Insofar as value collapse is more widespread, that is institution-wide or society-wide, and insofar as that collapse value exerts control over the, the social and physical environment, the less likely we'll get such chance enthralling encounters. What that looks like is, to me, pretty simple. It's like college campuses without arts and humanities or efficient cities and 
work campuses without genuine beauty and only like emotionless corporate crap. So here's the last thing I want to say. Here's another way to put it. So in other work, I've described an echo chamber as a social structure where you systematically distrust outside voices. And that lets you undermine counter evidence. So it's a sticky belief system because the belief system involves beliefs that make you think everyone not in my group who doesn't share my beliefs is evil. And so you dismiss incoming information. What I'm suggesting is that value collapse is like an echo chamber for your soul. It's not that escape is impossible, but the more control your collapse value exerts, the less likely you will be to encounter and attend to anything that's inspiring or enthralling or some other rich version, uh, some rich vision of some other value. That's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, T. Um, just a reminder, there have been little messages on the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions, please do put them into the chat function in YouTube, and I will get to those in a minute. Um, first, I am going to hog the Q&A and ask T some questions. I have like a massive sheet of questions here, but I'm only going to ask one or two. Um, <sighs> okay, so... I have too many questions. Okay, first one. Um, it seems like value collapse isn't always a bad thing. Um, so if I am trying to buy a new vacuum cleaner, um, it seems like having standardized ways of comparing vacuum cleaners so that I get the best one um it's kind of reasonable that's also relies on um explicit quantified measures um, mostly i think um yeah because i guess i'm not that fussed about what who what vacuum cleaner i end up buying um but it does seem like in other situations it kind of does matter um yeah, I don't know. Is, so <laughs> is there an easy way to demarcate cases where value collapse is actually just kind of useful and cases um, where it can potentially be quite harmful? I have a possible demarcation um, and then I'm going to kind of take it back. Uh, so okay. I, think the, I think the real worry is that there's not a clear demarcation because having a clear demarcation would depend on knowing in advance what the right values were would be to have. Um, but there's a bunch of things to say here. So first, uh, so in writing about value capture, one of the things, uh, so that earlier idea, value capture, just having your values uh, taken over by an external, there are a lot of cases where it starts to seem like, no, maybe sometimes value capture is kind of good. Like I think some people asked me, they were like, look, if we could get everyone value captured um, by the goal of reducing CO2 emissions or increase getting vaccinated, right? Wouldn't you take that? And my first thought is like, yeah. So maybe one, one response that you could have is something like, the thinner the v collective efforts, cooperation requires that we have some kind of extremely clear value that we can cohere around, right? Um, so it may be the two operate as vast collectives, we sometimes need to all converge on some clear value. Um, but that, there's a complex trade-off for that, right? You don't get tailored, personal, nuanced values. So I think it's occasionally justified when you have a vast collective effort towards a clear target, right? Um, I, I've suggested before that what we should actually have is a view that I kind of want to call a value federalism, right? That they're just like there are reasons to have different levels of laws, like state, national laws, state laws, city, county laws, city laws at different levels of, uh, of tailoring. There's a reason to have values like that too. So that, that's things that I've said about value capture. Think about the value cops case. I mean, the worry is something like this. You want to think, look, if I know it to be unimportant, I can just offload it. I can let someone else deal with it. Super simple, super clear, 
I just need to look at Consumer Reports. I mean, I do this too. When I buy a dishwasher, I just check the magazine Consumer Reports. The worry is that doing that well depends on having a prior sense of what values are rich and what values are thin. And the whole worry here is that we don't know ahead of time which values are thin and which values are rich. And you can see, I mean, you can probably think of examples from your own life, right? I think here's the thing. I, in an earlier part of my life, would have said, okay, I'll just be value collapsed about exercise because it's really boring and interesting and all it is is for weight loss. So I'll, I'll just, you know, outsource that and pursue some simple target because it's not important. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole worry, the, whole, the, the thing that drives this worry is that a lot of the times we don't know ahead of time that something is valuable and we have an in proper conception of it and we need to spend time with it, right? So, I mean, I think the, the quick answer to you is, yes, value collapse is fine for those values that are not rich and unimportant, but then the whole driver of my account is that a lot of the times we have that wrong and we need a way to learn about when we have that wrong. Yep, okay, thank you. I'm going to ask one sneaky philosophy question or yeah, a sneaky technical question and then uh, get to the, the questions in the chat. Um, so I totally am on board with the idea that um, having very focused attention on these explicit quantified values can make you more close minded. Um, but it also seems like these very kind of fuzzy values just because they're harder to engage with might be difficult to apply error metabolism to. Whereas it seems like if you've got these like really nice, clear, crisply defined, measurable values, um, you, it's easier to tell when they're going wrong. It's easier to tell what's wrong with them. And so it's easier to fix them. So in a way, the kind of explicit values in some ways um, make error metabolism easier than the, the fuzzy ones. Yeah. I yeah, that's, that's so. So one of the things I have to balance all this stuff out with is the positive story about games, because I think in games, you actually get a sense in which the clarity of the values does exactly what you say. It helps with error metabolism. So um, I remember, so I was trying to, again, exercise stories, trying to get a feel for my body and a feel for like how it worked. And I did yoga for a while. And one of the things about yoga is if your mind drifts, your mind drifts and you don't really notice that your mind is drifting. And one of the interesting things about climbing is that success and failure are so binary that it smacks you in the face, right? If you don't have deep attention to your body, you will fall off the rock. And so that really makes it, it makes the, it boosts the errors, right? It makes the errors really clear. Mm -hmm. um, the worry is that that only gives you error metabolism for the explicitly stated value and things that are directly connected to the explicitly stated value. And it doesn't give you error. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll give you the simplest example I can think of. Um, suppose that you clarified the goal of education to student graduation rate and speed it becomes really easy to notice when a new policy screws that up. But you're not going to notice anything that is connected to some value that is not captured by that statement. Does that make sense? So, I mean, I think, yeah. I think that's the whole point, right? That we like heuristics because they're easy to apply. And so it's easy to collect data in the area that is hit by the simplified heuristic. But the worry is if it leaves anything out, then that stuff is not gonna enter the error metabolism process. And so the big problem is like this kind of like, maybe the way I should put it is, all, the, clear statement, the clear statement of value makes error metabolism about its particular target easier, but you lose kind of like meta error metabolism, right? You lose the ability to quickly, to gather data that the value itself has been formulated wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to bring in another question. Um, 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 all right, let's go for that one. All right, so 
Uh, the question um, from Liam Perry. It seems like explicit values have a trade-off. They lose richness, but they appear to be more publicly accessible. Is there a worry that a push towards inexplicit values would become exclusionary? Yep. Th this is a great question uh, and a question I've been pretty obsessed with. Uh, one quick answer is go going to be that it is simultaneously exclusionary and sensitizing at the same time. So maybe the best way I can answer this question is through a bit of a detour. So another so a paper I've written in this space that's already out is called Transparency Surveillance. Um, and there I got really worried specifically about transparency metrics that were engineered through and through for accessibility. Um, the point of a transparency metric is that anyone can evaluate it and anyone can see if the person uh, or the group that's under, a uh, uh, under the eye of the transparency system is screwing up. The worry is for me that since transparency metrics have to be authored in a way that is comprehensible to the public, they cannot target reasons that are comprehensible only to experts. So one way to put it is that insofar as transparency puts experts under the control, the oversight of non-experts and binds the reasoning of experts to non-expert oversight, to that extent, it undermines experts' ability to operate from their expertise. I think you get something similar um, with, so for those of you in the philosophy space, uh, I can say the considerations of standpoint epistemology. Um, so this is the generally the view that groups, oppressed groups uh, have a particular understanding of their situation that comes from living in that, in, uh, in that circumstance of oppression. Um, and again, the worry is on the one, so here's a weird thought for me. Uh, people on the liberal progressive side of the world often believe one, that we should make things more transparent and reasoning more accessible. And two, believe that groups who are oppressed have special understanding and sensitivity to their circumstance that aren't generally accessible. So there's this weird sense in which something like transparency at the same time forces a certain kind of public accessibility, but also destroys the capacity for different groups to have expertise or to have sensitivity. So, I mean, at this point, it becomes kind of hard to say whether that's increased accessibility or not. Does, does that make sense? So, I mean, may, maybe the maybe the quickest way to put the put the answer is I'm not sure accessibility, especially accessibility tied to oversight, is always good. Insofar as we think that some groups have expertise and some groups have uh, have special sensitivity. Um, of course, you can't do without it because then you have the worries of people being corrupt and people being biased. But the, the general answer is more accessibility is not always good. And I, I think that puts me in a different place than a lot of my peers. Okay. Can I just run that through with an example? Um, okay. So <laughs> because we've used it a lot, university rankings, or I guess any other kind of rankings of any other companies or interests, um, uh, so if we kind of explicitly measure the quality of university degrees in different places, um, in some sense, that's way more inclusion, may, way more inclusive than having people just in the past rely on their local social networks to tell them which universities are better than others. So in that way, having standardized metrics is more inclusive and getting rid of them would be um, it would take away an important source of information for people who couldn't already access it. So how does what you just say apply to that example? Okay, that, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. So the way to put it is that in the movement to university rankings, you simultaneously get an increase in the accessibility of the information and a decrease in the rich quality of the information um, and you lose from the information any of the sensitivities that wouldn't that don't get gathered by the large scale metric. So there's a weird one way to put it is that 
the more I look at the literature on bureaucracy and the aggregation of information at scale, the more I think there's a price for large scale accessibility. And the price for large scale accessibility is the loss of detail and nuance in the information stream. And I'm worried that there's no perfect solve for this, that you just have a trade off. And the more accessible you make information at scale, the more detail you lose from that information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you end up with weird situations where we as people in the business know that so and so shouldn't be at number two this year, that there's some like weird fluke in the way that the measures work. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, sorry, I'm just choosing another question. Um, oh, okay, let's try that one. That looks difficult. <laughs> all right, so Ben Schofield asks, in management, paired metrics are sometimes used. You don't just pick one metric, but you always pair it with another that counters it. Would adhering to ex opposing explicit values work here as well? Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's 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 a great question. Um, so let me talk about two structures that I can imagine. So one is what you're describing, which is pairing a explicit value with an opposed explicit value. And another is pairing regular use of an explicit value with occasional oversight from a more inchoate value. Um, so I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. So the worry with the pairing from the two explicit values is that you've increased the information in the stream, but you've only increased it. You have two spotlights instead of one, right? So I can imagine something like, okay, well, we have, uh, the, the question is just going to be, what are the metrics? So if all, if the metrics are all, um, if the metrics are subject to the pr kind of processes I've described, then having two metrics will involve two forms of thinning. So now you have a countervailing source of information to your first metric, but that too is subject to the same narrowing. So, um, so imagine that your university originally targets student employment rate and then worries that that's not enough. And so they come up with an opposed metric. Maybe it's student satisfaction, right? Now you have a system that can capture more, but it's still two narrowed senses of capture. If anything that doesn't fit into one of those, student satisfaction or, uh, eval or uh, employment rate isn't gonna enter into the consideration. Um, Another alternative, especially given the fact uh, that we are limited beings that do need heuristics to function, another possibility is, so in the game stuff, one of the things I talked about was when you play games aesthetically, you often narrow yourself and throw yourself into a point system for long periods of time. And then in between, when you put the game away, you step back and you ask yourself, from a more inchoate, from a more rich and open-ended perspective, right? Was that fun? Was that interesting? Was that worthwhile? Did that make my life better? Um, did I enjoy that? Did that teach me something? And that, I think, that solution is an interesting solution to me because that's one that doesn't require you to operate for most of your time with these kind of rich inchoate values, but it, it builds in the opportunity of checking in on your process from a more ill-defined and in my sense, open-minded perspective. So I think that is better because at least somewhere in the stream is a reflective process that is built to take in new forms of information. Yep. Yeah, thank you. All right, another question from Annalie Jefferson. Uh, I was wondering whether, given that lots of values need sustained attention, uh, don't we have to limit value receptivity as a purely practical matter? <laughs> I, 
Yes. <laughs> I mean, this is the thing you're talking about. I, I Can I just say yes and drink coffee? Now, the thing that you're talking about is kind of, to me, I think all the stuff I've been talking about today is just kind of whittling away at this, to me, like deeply profound and in some way unsolvable, uh, unsolvable dilemma is that's kind of like what it is to be us and what it is to be human, which is we are limited beings. There's information overload, right? Yeah. One way to cope with information overload is to shut down most of the information streams. So we can't attend to everything all the time, right? So um, I think if you try to listen to everything and try to take in all the information at once, you'd be overwhelmed. You couldn't do anything, right? So you need to shh, close down your information stream. But if you close it down and build the boundaries incredibly tightly, right? Then you get relief from overload but then you'll never notice anything outside of those boundaries. So what we need is this weird balancing act, right? We need to be, we need to close things down enough to narrow our attention enough to focus in a particular way that we can actually function. And at the same time, we need to build in some kind of mechanism for when our method of closing down is focused on totally the wrong thing. So I think yeah. that's, that's why when I think about how our attention guiding values should be stated. It's not be open to everything all the time. Think anything is valuable. It's have a heuristic, have a guess at what's valuable that narrows your vision, but don't build it with impermeable boundaries. And the worry is that the, I mean, the worry is that the more tightly and explicitly you state the values, the more you'll go so far in the direction of closing down from new information inputs that you'll never be able to maneuver or change or respond to new information. Does that, yeah. does that kind of work? Does yeah, I think help? so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, oh, how difficult a question do I want to ask you? Let's go for this one, which is a little bit different. Oh God, more coffee. <laughs> Okay, so any thoughts about how languages or dialects, perhaps understood as games, as Wittgenstein suggested, capture values? Does greater linguistic precision um, involve a danger of value collapse? Or I guess maybe a related question about how different languages might uh, capture values differently to each other and in some sense lead to value capture in that way. It's Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Um, so uh that's a great question so i think i i hope something has come out is that what i mean by um explicitness here is very specific it is that the value has mechanical or formulaic application criteria and that you can just like quickly move on to the world that's not the same as linguistic precision um mm -hmm. and i mean Maybe one way to put it is in the background, the goofy stuff in the background here for me is stuff about how, uh, so, okay, l l let me try this. One of the reasons I got in the space was noticing how richly some senses of value in the world were captured by literature and poetry and how poorly they are captured by things like university mission statements and outcomes assessment guides. Um, and so I keep having this experience, by the way, uh, where I like lose my sense of what's valuable in the world. And in my case, uh, I go back and I read Dostoevsky, by the way, the person I read to restore my sense of value in the world has changed with time. When I was a teenager, it was JD Salinger. And then at some point it was mm -hmm. Vonnegut and now it's become like Dostoevsky and Elizabeth Bishop and, um, Emily Dickinson. These are where I go to like get a refresh of my sense of values in the world. And so there's a sense, you see what I mean? In a poem, in a Dickinson poem, there is a great sense of artistic precision with language to convey something. 
But at the same time, the thing being conveyed is not something that can be quickly applied by any employee in an institution to a candidate value. I mean, I think it is both the case that an Emily Dickinson poem is both very linguistically precise. And ima imagine the uproar if we distributed grading rubrics where for every category to describe the goodness of the thing, I put it in an Emily Dickinson poem, right? The, 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 the objectivity, uh, the... So I think there's a difference between the concept of linguistic precision and the concept of reliable applicability. Um, maybe one, one useful thing to add, the, the one thing that might be useful. So I've been reading Lorraine Dastin's incredible book on rules. Lorraine Dastin is, this, is an extraordinary intellectual historian. And her, this is a book about how the ch concept of a rule has changed over time. And she says that, we, we used to, that there were several different conceptions of rules, but one of the earlier conceptions was something like what you might call a principle. And a principle is a kind of general statement that has to be applied with judgment and an attention to possible exceptions in each case, right? It has to be applied with expertise. Mm -hmm. So uh, a principle might be something like, you know, um, show don't tell, but of course, what can, sometimes we can break, uh, like a, a master fiction teller can break that sometimes, right? And what counts as showing and not telling is kind of complex. On the other hand, what Dastin says, there's another sense of rule, something that's been arisen much more recently that she calls an algorithmic rule. And that's something that can be applied. She, she thinks in the most modern era, era, what we mean is applied by a machine. But before that, she thinks it, it means it can be applied by any employee. You don't need someone that with 10 years of training, she can hire almost anyone and they can apply the rule and make it work. And so I think the thing that I'm calling explicitness of value is something like an algorithmic role, but it is about the speed of applicability, which is very different, I think, from linguistic precision, which mm -hmm. hopefully the poetry case makes clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh... Hmm. All right, let's go with that one. All right, so. Uh, T is addressing one of the most fundamental problems of modern Western culture. Yep. Uh, my question is this, how do we recover whole populations captivated by value capture? Um, Holy I shit, I don't know. I wish I knew. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but there, there were these kind of maybe different cases that you were talking about in your talk. So one is with institutions where we actually had a pretty good idea of how to assess how well we were teaching or developing products no. or working with customers. Um, and that has kind of dropped out when we start using quantifiable measures. Uh, but there might be places where we never had that in the first place, or there were some people in that community who never had that in the first place. Um, yeah, but I guess this this is where <laughs> the, the values were never uncaptured in the first place. I mean, okay. I would love it if I knew the answer here. I feel like I'm just describing. Maybe, maybe the answer is that we should all do philosophy degrees. Maybe that's the answer. I mean, I mean, there's some sense in which the answer here is really simple. Like, don't cut your humanities from your gen ed, people. Like, <laughs> make sure people... I mean, the, so I can say that one of the things that really got me in this project was just starting to look at the process by which the humanities, the arts, philosophy are getting cut out of education. And it often looks like, well, look, STEM degrees have more deliverables, right? We can clear, more clearly show people get, people get jobs faster, get better, uh, uh, get better jobs, and um, we can assess more clearly what they've learned, and who knows what the fuck you got out of your general education music appreciation class. We don't know how to measure that. And so yeah. that loses a battle, all kinds of battles every day. And so there's, there's some, there's some sense in which, I mean, this is a new argument for an old thought, which is keep value richness in the curriculum. Um, but your question was specifically about what to do when an entire population is 
value collapsed. And in some sense, I don't know if that one can recover from that. The hope is that we can, st I mean, maybe I should, the, the reason that I have this funky term value collapse is really I keep like having this image of black holes in my head, right? Like things that collapse and suck in everything around them. And there's some worry that by the time you have a world that has been completely reshuffled enough to exclude any encounters with anything that might show you anything with value, it, it might be too late. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's something we can recover from. Um, I don't yeah. think we're there yet. There, there are still sources of value other than money and satisfaction surveys that are around in the world. Um, but there's this weird sense in which, I mean, sometimes the answers I have are mostly individual answers, right? They're answers in terms of like, each of us in our hearts can fight to keep a grip on something bigger than some metric. The worry is that large scale institutions can't function with anything except clear metrics. And mm -hmm. as we move forward into a more deeply inter interconnected world functioning at large scale, the more we'll find the, uh, these metrics pervasively. And I, I do have a worry that there is and this is a worry that comes a lot from reading James Scott seeing like a state over and over again, a worry that we're not going to get an institutional solution to this because institutional solutions will still be bound by the same kind of constraint and only be able to hit the kinds of targets that can be measured and understood at the institutional scale, which will be the kinds of goods that are denuanced. So if you're, if you get into this view that people like James Scott, and Theodore Porter really push, which is something like information collation at scale always leaves out nuance. Then if you ask me, how do I create a policy that an institution can follow that can target the kinds of things that are inherently invisible to institutions? I don't know. Maybe the answer is we should try to limit the scope of the institutions we live in. But again, I don't know how to do that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, uh, let, me, let, let me say one more thing. What, 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 yeah. One more thing. One quick, one quick thing before I forget, before I turn totally pessimistic. I think you can see there are all of these descriptions about what I think of as like resistant forces. The one I've talked so far about is the aesthetic force, but I think there's also a lot of the older descriptions of what it is to be ironic involves some distance from the kind of easy values around you and a lot of descriptions about what it is to play um, to be playful uh, maria lagones has this extraordinary paper on playfulness is shifting between different normative worlds and landscapes and inhabiting them lightly that these are all i think kind of resistant tendencies and again they're tendencies that often i think our institutions don't cultivate because they don't have measurable outcomes but they're around. It's not like we don't know what those tendencies are. Yeah. All right. I just flagged a question because it was linked to what you were just talking about with irony. Can you maybe say just a couple more sentences on what, right. how that works and what it is? Right. Okay. So um, what I mean by ironic detachment uh, in this sense is I think it's one thing to pursue. Okay. We are going to live in institutions. We're going to be surrounded by metrics. We're going to be surrounded by metrics that can't capture everything. One thing we can do is live with them knowing that they're kind of denuanced institutional values and that we have to interact with them, but not take them into our hearts. And the other thing we could do is the thing that I'm worried about in value capture, which is we just decide that's what's important, right? High status on the rankings is what's important. High citation rates are what's important. High page views are what's important. Um, and there's a lot of empirical work from the people I cited about how this seems to happen in large scale institutions, especially people in charge uh, ten and a lot of people working within the institutions over time tend to just internalize and take on as their central targets these values. So I think the difference is from the value collapse narrative. If you remain, if you participate and are willing to target such metrics in your professional role, but still have access to kind of more unbounded, vague, richer values, 
those can still inform how you function of the institution when you apply the metrics and when you don't. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, my version of this in my own life is, this is something I struggle a lot with, is how, how I do grading in my classes, right? On the one hand, I know I have to do grading um, because if I don't do grading, the students will riot and the university will riot and the way the university functions won't function. Uh, on the other hand, there are different ways to present that grading and to remember that the grading isn't the end all and be all and to sometimes do things that won't give perfect grading. So here, here, here's just a simple example from my own life. Um, I give my students really open ended final exams and final projects, which they can do in different media and they can pursue topics they're interested in. It is harder to evaluate them perfectly objectively against each other, right? If they've come up with their own topics and are doing, one student's making a podcast, another's doing it as a script, another's doing it as um, an essay, it's a little bit harder to perfectly evaluate what counts as a B versus what counts as a B plus, right? So if I thought grading is it, that's what we're doing, the most important thing is to grade well, I wouldn't do that kind of thing. But because I think, I try to maintain some detachment from the importance of grading. I can think, no, well, we have to do this thing, but we also don't have to give ourselves completely to it. And sometimes we can trade away grading accuracy in pursuit of other goals, like engagement and love and excitement of the students that we can't measure as easily. Yep. Okay. I'm actually tempted to leave it there on a slightly positive note on um, how Please. we can deal with value collapse in our own lives. Um, yeah, so uh, we are also just about at 10 o'clock. Um, so thank you so much for T for the talk and for the discussion. And thank you to everybody who submitted questions. I think we had like a pretty deep discussion there about the nature of Western civilization. Um, so yeah, thank you again for coming. That's all. And uh, yeah, hope to see you at the next um, annual lecture for the Royal Institute of Philosophy. Thank you.